Hello everyone, today we're going to look at how to find the in-order predecessor in a binary search tree. So let's get started. Now, if you're new here, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and most importantly, click that notification bell if you enjoy this content. So just as a recap, a binary search tree is a binary tree in which any node n is greater than all the values in its left subtree and less than all the values in its right subtree. And that applies to every single node in the binary search tree, where all nodes to the left of that node are smaller than that node, and all nodes to the right of that node are larger than that node. Now let's look at the in-order predecessor. So given a node n, the node that comes before it in an in-order traversal is going to be that node's in-order predecessor. So if you look at our output here, where we have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, all the way up to 150, if you look at any value in this output, pick for example 110, its predecessor is going to be the value that comes right before it, so it's going to be 100. If you pick 80, its predecessor is going to be 70. If you picked 150, its predecessor is going to be 140. So you kind of get the idea here. Now what we're going to do is analyze this binary search tree and try to figure out where this in-order predecessor actually lies for some given node n. Now suppose our node n was a node with data 140. Then all these nodes in this rectangle are going to be smaller than 140. However, only one of these nodes is actually the predecessor. Now let's think about what an in-order traversal actually means. Taking a look at our output, for 140, the value just before 140 has to be the value that's just smaller than 140. And now let's take a look at our tree. What do we know about a node with data 140? Well, we know that if it has a left subtree, then all the nodes to the left of that node are going to be smaller than that node. And all the nodes to the right of that node are going to be larger than that node. But we also know if there are nodes in 140's left subtree, then those nodes are going to be the closest nodes smaller than 140. Now a question might be, then why isn't 120 in 140's left subtree? Or why isn't 100 in 140's left subtree? Or why isn't 110 in 140's left subtree? Again, these values are all smaller than 140. So the reason is because they were either inserted before 140 or moved there via some rotation in the case of an AVL tree, which is a self-balanced and binary search tree. So either way, you could have gotten them there. Now, if 140 does have a left subtree, it means that the nodes in 140's left subtree have values that are bigger than all the other nodes leading up to 140. If it was smaller, then it would be in one of those nodes' left subtrees. Now, since there's only one node in 140's left subtree, then that node has to be 140's predecessor. So in this case, that's 130. Now, if our n was 120, then all these nodes in this rectangle are going to be smaller than 120. However, only one of these nodes is going to be 120's predecessor. And if you look at our output, that value is going to be 110. So how do we get to 110? Well, what do we know about 120's left subtree? We know that if 120's left subtree is not empty, then all those nodes are going to be just smaller than 120. However, only one of these nodes can be the closest to 120. And if you think about it, that's going to be the largest node in 120's left subtree. Because it's going to be smaller than 120, but also closest to 120 as well. So ultimately, we're finding the maximum element in 120's left subtree. So at 120's left, we look for the maximum element, which is going to be our node with value 110, and we're done. Now, what if our n was 130? Well, 130's left subtree is empty. But we can see that all these values in this rectangle are smaller than 130. So there must be a predecessor. And from our output, that predecessor is 120. Now, let's assume that all of our nodes have parent references. So starting from our node 130, we can reach its parent, which is 140, by going up the tree. Now we know that the node above it, which is its right parent, is going to have a value that's more than 130, because our right parent is going to be more than its left child. And we know that all right parents going up the tree are going to be more than 130. So what we want to look for is the first left parent going up the tree, or the first left ancestor to 130. The reason being is because the first left ancestor to 130 is going to be just smaller than 130 because 130 exists in that ancestor's right subtree. And because the first left ancestor has a right subtree, it means that all the nodes in its right subtree are going to be closer but larger than that node. So that's why 120 is going to be the predecessor to 130. So starting at 130, we go up to 140, then we go up to 120, and that's going to be 130's predecessor. Now, if n was 90, we have the same situation here, where we don't have a left subtree to search in. And we know that all these values in this rectangle are going to be smaller than 90. But we do know that if 90 doesn't have a left subtree, the first left ancestor is going to be that node's predecessor. So if you go up the tree, 100 is the first right ancestor, 
Then we get 120, which is also a right ancestor. But we finally get to 80, which is going to be the first left ancestor. So 80 is going to be the predecessor to 90. Now, if n was 110, suppose we didn't have parent references. So that means we couldn't go up the tree. But given that we have access to the root node, this is very easy. Because starting from the root, we can just do a simple search to find 110. And while we search, we can update a reference variable to keep track of nodes that have values that are closest to 110. So starting from a root node 80, we'll update a reference variable called ancestor node as we go down the tree and find values that are closer to 110. So originally, our ancestor node would be set to 80. And since 80 is less than 110, we'll go to the right to see if we can find a value that's more than 80, but still less than 110. And we've reached 120. Now 120 is clearly more than 110, so we'll go to the left. And 100 is clearly more than 80 and less than 110. So what we'll do is update our ancestor node to reference a node with value 100. Now since 110 is more than 100, we'll go to the right. And we've reached our value of 110. So we know that we found the predecessor going toward this node. So we can simply return from this method. Now going through the tree, there were two cases we had to consider. The first case was if our node n has a non-empty left subtree. And in that case, we simply found the maximum element or the maximum value in our node's left subtree. The second case was that our node n has an empty left subtree. And for that case, if we had parent references, we can work our way up the tree and find the first left ancestor to that node. And if we didn't have parent references, we'll start from the root node and work our way back down toward that node, updating our reference to the node with the closest value to that node. Now we're going to use the same tree node class that we've been using for the last few videos. So here you have our tree node class with three instance variables. We have our data that will be associated with every single node in our binary search tree. And we have our left and right reference variables that will be a left and right subtrees respectively in our binary search tree. And here we have a constructor that will take in some arguments data that will be used to initialize our instance variable data with. Now for the first case, the node n has a non-empty left subtree. So if our node n was 120, then its left subtree would consist of 90, 100, and 110. And we know we need to find the maximum value in that left subtree. So we can make use of that find max method we defined a couple of videos ago. So the first thing we'll do is check if our right is not equal to null. And since 100's right is not equal to null, we can call find max on its right subtree, giving us the node with value 110 as we return from the recursive call. Now for the second case, our node n has an empty left subtree. And since our class does not have a parent reference, we'll start from the root node and work our way down to our node with value 110. Now I'm going to call this method previous smaller ancestors since we're looking for the previous smaller ancestor to a node with value 110. So in this method, we're going to take in two arguments. The first argument, which is going to be n, is going to be the node we're trying to find the previous smaller ancestor for. And the ancestor node is a reference that we want to update as we go down the tree toward n. So let's go through this method step by step. So the first thing we want to do is check if our current node's data is less than our 110. And since 80 is less than 110, we'll call pre smaller ancestor on 80's right subtree and update our ancestor node to 80. Now we're back to the start of our method again. So we check if our current node, which has a value of 120, is less than 110. And 120 is not less than 110. So we check if our 120 is more than 110. And 120 is more than 110. So we'll call pre smaller ancestor on 120's left subtree, since we want values that are smaller than 110. As we go down the tree, we'll get to values that are closer to 110. And notice that we're not changing our ancestor node, because 120 is clearly more than 110, so there's no reason to update it. Now we're back to the start of our method again, and we check if our current node, which has a value of 100, is less than 110. And 100 is less than 110. So we'll call prev smaller ancestor in 100's right subtree, changing our ancestor node to our node with value 100. And again, we're back to the start of our method. So we check if our current node, which is 110, is less than 110. And 110 is not less than 110. So we check if 110 is more than 110. And 110 is not more than 110. So at this point, all we have to do is return our ancestor node. And that gets returned back to the method that called it. And so on and so forth until we get our node with value 100. And we're done. Now all we have to do is incorporate these two method calls in our in-order predecessor method. So the first thing we'll do is check if our n is equal to null. And if our n is equal to null, then none of these cases apply. So we can simply just return null. Otherwise, we can check for case 1. So if our n.left is not equal to null, which means our n has a left subtree, then we want to find the maximum value in our left subtree. So we'll call n.left.findmax to get that maximum node. Now, if our n doesn't have a left subtree, then we can call prev smaller ancestor on n and null. 
Null is passed in because of the case that our node actually doesn't have a predecessor. So imagine if you were to find the minimum node in our binary search tree. Then the minimum node will not have a predecessor because nothing comes before the minimum node. And in that case, I'll simply return null. So it's pretty simple. Now let's go over the complexity analysis. So both our time and space complexity are pretty straightforward for this method. Both our find max and previous smaller ancestor methods traverse the height of the tree. And both do a constant number of operations for each node. So our time complexity is going to be big O of H. And moving on to the space complexity, since we're using recursion for these methods, both of these methods traverse the height of the tree. And for every node we come across, it adds one stack frame to our call stack, thereby resulting in a big O of H space complexity. If you enjoyed this content, please hit that like and subscribe button. See you in the next video.